it's Phil here from the Gear Summit Shop. Uh, tuna season is just around the corner. We're actually filming this on May 30th, um, so in a couple of days it all kicks off. Um, lots and lots of people coming in the store getting outfitted. Um, we've been putting top shots on like crazy, and we've also um, been doing a lot of talking about tuna fishing. So I thought we'd rerun the tuna session for you. We did this a couple of months ago and also at the boat show. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover a few things. I'm going to cover the regulations, which in itself can be a bit of a nightmare. We're going to cover some of the gear you need, and I've got some of it laid out here on the table, which I can show you. Where to go, some advice on uh, where you can actually go to fish. Some of the techniques to use, uh, whether it be trolling, live baiting, run and gun, etc. Um, how you land one, uh, but also what you do after you landed one. Okay, so that's kind of like the agenda. Um, we're going to get into it right now. And what you'll also see, sorry, as I go through this presentation, just about here, you'll start seeing the slides coming up. Um, so you'll be able to see what I'm talking to. Um, there's some links on there. Feel free to copy and paste those because they're quite informational. So firstly, there's three types of tuna license. Uh, we start with the big boy license, which is the commercial license. And the commercial license is in Massachusetts. It's a federal license. It costs 26 bucks, $52 if you add swordfish to it. And what it does, it gives you the right to catch a commercial size fish, which is 73 inches or above. Um, it's a heavily regulated um, category. You have to report all of your findings and you legally have to sell your fish to a licensed fish buyer. It's absolutely mandatory. And then you need to report to know about it. So your license to sell is actually a state requirement. So in the state of Massachusetts, it's $130. For a resident, $260 for a non-resident to get a license to sell fish. But the key thing is, you've got to sell them. If you catch a 72-inch fish, you legally got to throw it back. Okay? And the license, and the, sorry, the, the season starts June the 1st. Um, and what the season does, it changes as you go. So last year, for example, there was a number of periods of time where because too many fish were being caught, they closed the, the, the category. Okay? Or they'll start with one fish per day. And then it could get to four fish per day. You don't know. But there's actually a website um, on the permits page of NOAA where you can actually check on a daily basis to see what the next day's regulations are. But it's really important to keep on. So commercial is for big fish. You cannot keep a fish for yourself. You physically have to sell it. Okay. Then you've got the other end is the recreational angler. The recreational angler season starts June 1. And... Again, seasonally, it changes. So this year, um, 2020, they set the regulations out. You're allowed to, to catch two school size, which is over 27 inches, under, under 48 inches. Sorry, two of those a day. And per day, you're allowed to keep one small to medium size fish, which is 48 inches and above and under 73 so 72 and three quarters is okay. If it weighs over 73, you have to throw it back. And whilst I'm talking about throwing back, it's really unfortunate if a recreational angler catches and the fish dies a 78 inch fish, you legally have to throw it over the side of your boat. Well, you should never bring it in your boat, but even if the fish is dead, it has to be released. You cannot use the fish has died as an excuse to bring it back to dock. You will be prosecuted if you are caught. Okay, so just bear that in mind. So what you are now is you actually can catch two small ones and one medium one. If you catch that in a day, you've had an epic day on the water. You've also probably got between 100 and 200 pounds of tuna meat, which is, you know, it's going to keep quite a big family going for a long time. Um, bear that in mind as well. And then you've got the last license, which is called a charter headboat license. And charter headboats, the prerequisite is that you get your OUPV or six pack. So I have a charter captain's license. Um, and it allows you to fish in both categories, okay? And it's designed for people who are looking to charter their boat. You know, we charter Yoshki, our boat here at the shop. Don't do it very often, but we do actually take people out on charters and we support a number of charities and use the charter head boat as a mechanism to help with that. The charter guys can actually keep a lot of fish this year. So if they catch a small fish, they're allowed to keep six school size bluefin per day. So that again is... 27 to 48, or under 48, um, and then they're allowed to catch, so just checking my notes, two 48 to 73 inch fish a day. So potentially they can keep eight fish, 
And based on the fact you have a charter with six people on it, it's over one fish per person. So it's a ridiculous amount of fish to keep. Um, it's also a lights out day if you're catching and retaining that many fish, but it gives them a lot of flexibility. And what a charter guy can do is if the giant season is open, the commercial season is open, and they catch a commercial size fish um, on the day, first fish of the day, hypothetically, if I go and I catch an 80 inch fish and I choose to keep that fish, I've now categorized into commercial. And as a commercial angler, then I legally have to sell that fish. And if we carry on fishing for fun, I catch a 65 inch fish, I cannot keep that fish, I legally have to let it go. So you kind of fit in both camps. Um, charter head boat and commercial boats, depending on their size, also start to have to adhere to other commercial requirements. So I run a 39 foot boat. I legally have to have a life raft on the boat um, in a hard case with a hydrostatic release and placed in a position where it can inflate automatically without moving anything. So I have mine mounted on the deck. I have survival suits on my boat. I need, you need a survival suit for every member of the party on the boat. And I also have an EPIRB on. If your boat is under 25 foot, I think it is, you need less safety requirements. But there is a safety um, requirements you need. You, you know, the Coast Guard will inform you. You also need to get your vessel inspected if you have a bigger boat by the Coast Guard and they give you a stamp to prove you to use that boat as a commercial vessel. And remember, these licenses I've just talked about, the three licenses are linked to your boat, not you. So don't be thinking me as a charter captain can jump on your boat and suddenly my license is on that boat. No, it is registered to the boat. And it doesn't necessarily need me on it, but it does need a licensed captain on the boat, okay? So that's a little bit, it's actually quite confusing. And what there is on the sh screen there, you've got some useful websites. You've got the permits where you can go buy. You can also check the news, which is really important you do that. Um, if, the, if the regulations change in a day, um, you not reading the regs is not a good excuse to the EPO or the Coast Guard. You will be prosecuted. So you need to know. I check mine every day before we go on the water. We have a routine on the boat with me and the guys. It's normally two, three o'clock in the morning. First thing I do is I check the weather conditions because that's really important. Second thing I do is check uh, NOAA just to see if there's any news I need to know about. So that's about it on the regulations. There is one anomaly and that anomaly is called the trophy category in recreational, which allows a recreational boat to capture one and retain one fish over 73 inches per season, okay? Um, you are allowed to keep the fish, you're not allowed to sell it because your recreation does not. So it's important to tell you that in case you've heard of it, but please bear in mind, it always gets canceled earlier in the season because too many get caught. This year, they canceled trophy before the even season has started. So recreational anglers with your recreational license out there, you're absolutely tied into that and you cannot keep in any way, shape or form a 73 or more. Okay? I'd say any questions on there, but you can't give me questions. So, if we move on. So, let's look at some of the gear. Okay? Trolling is the, the classic way to catch tuna, whether it be squid bars, whether it be ballyhoo, whether it be lures. We tend to use our 80s as our main start. This here... Is an 80 class setup by Penn. Um, it's got the carbon with the inertia guides, which is our preferred choice of rod platform. Um, you can catch big fish. We use what's called a number four butt on them. The number four butt, you can actually fight the fish in the gunnel and you can actually fight the fish in a harness. Um, eight is really good. If you get into live baiting, one of these big bad boys is a 130 class. And if you're fishing some areas, where you know smaller fish run, like south of the islands, you can come down to 50s or even smaller to make it more enjoyable. And on the spinning rods, you know, the spinning rods and reels are a massive step up. You know, this is a Shimano Stella, and this is paired with an Ocean Plugger, and we sell these in the store. The, um, the other reel we really love is the Saltiga um, by Daiwa. The Shimano Stella and the uh, Saltiga Dogfight are the only two reels you really want to take to fight big tuna. If you're fishing for smaller fish, uh, we really love the Shimano Saragossa and also the Twin Power as more cost-effective um, rods, uh, reel, excuse me. Um, but if you're really after the bigger fish, you really want a Stella or a Dogfight, in my personal opinion. Gaffs. Gaffs, actually, you, you really need two. I've got one here. Um, if you look at the size of that, you know, the gauge of the metal on that, this is the head gaff. We use one which is smaller gape like this, about this wide, three-inch gaff. For the tail for the simple reason that 
a bigger gape can get into uh, the flesh of a tuna's head. But if you imagine the tail is about diameter of my wrist, a big gaff like this can miss the tail. You can slide off, which you don't want near the boat, or a smaller one will actually get into the meat. Um, key thing on gaffing is to make sure you gaff them in the head first. But you're talking, you know, these are a fiberglass gaff. They're made locally by Jay Jigs. We love them. I did manage to break one last year. It took me seven years to break it. And it was because I was misusing it, I hasten to add. Um, I would not go for carbon graphite, really. Carbon graphite is really strong when you lift it up, but as soon as you pivot on it, you'll break it. And things like the AFGO aluminium ones, or aluminum as you Americans say, that'll last about 30 seconds in Tuna Town. So they're worth the investment, these gaffs. You need a harpoon kit, especially if you're catching the bigger fish. If you're anything over about over 70 inches, you really want to put a dart in it. Um, we sell them in a nice bag. I um, don't know where they are. I could show you in their offshore room. Um, they package into about a four foot bag so you can store them nice and easily. And then obviously you can assemble them during the fight, stick the fish and off you go. That has a keg line with a, a, a buoy on it. So that if just like the fish breaks away, you can actually keep it. It's a great way of getting into it. Commercially, we tend to stick all of the bigger fish, um, every single one. Then you need a kill bag. Um, kill bags are a big, heavy, insulated bag. You put your fish in it, you put the ice in it. Bear in mind, a tuna actually is a very oily fish, like bluefish or mackerel. They deteriorate very quickly in the sun and the heat, so you really need to ice them down. I'm gonna talk about the prep a little bit later in the presentation. A kill bag's essential if you haven't got a hold that can take the size of fish you're going for. Um, so, for example, when we fish offshore, I take a kill bag because if I'm fortunate enough to get a 100 plus inch fish on my boat, we struggle to get that in a hold. Okay, smaller fish, we put them straight in the hold with the ice. Okay, but a kill bag's a great way of insulating to protect your fish, because if you're eating it, you want it to be really fresh. If you're selling it, you need it to be really fresh, simple as that. Tail rope. Tail rope, in my opinion, is really important. It's the most inexpensive piece of kit on your boat, because all I use on my boat is a dock line, and we loop the loop on it, and um, you'll see my guys, when you talk to any of my guys who fish with me at the shop, is until you put the tail rope on the fish or get the fish on the deck, if it's a small one, the fight is not over. And all you do is put a loop in it back this, you have a loop on a dock line anyway, loop it through, make a lasso, tie it around the tail, lash it onto to a cleat, and then you've won, the fish can't get away. Okay, you're gonna need gloves um, uh, because the, the tuna line is under so much pressure um, the braided line will just cut you really easily and the mono will just hurt you, okay? Never, ever, ever wrap the line around your hands. Unfortunately, um, one of my captains lost a finger last year because he had the fish and the line got caught around his little finger and it pretty much pulled his finger off. So the line is real, but wear the gloves. Now, wear a nice rubber glove so you can do it. It makes the stripping process easier. The fish are pretty slimy and there's grease everywhere, so it just it's protecting you, the fish, your hands and everything. Um, you need a belt and a harness. If you're going to use something like this, an 80 or a 50, and you're going to use it stand up, you really want to um, use a harness. We sell a couple. We've got this one. Excuse me for doing that. This is by a company called Sea Mount. You see, it's actually a, it's a kite surfing um, one, which you can actually hold on to the guy behind, and you use what's called a plate on it. We also use a company called Black Magic, who make a fantastic fighting belt. Uh, what it's going to do is you're going to take the pressure off your back and off your arms because um, you clip in, you can actually let your arms go. Um, they're really cool to use. We might actually do an instructional video on that another time. And then on the lures, um, this is the Ron Z, very iconic lure. Uh, Ron Plyer, unfortunately, is no longer with us, but an absolute legend locally. It's a soft plastic tail. He used to infuse them actually with fish oil. Um, phenomenal tuna baits. Um, looks like a sorry. This is the um, silver metallic. Really good, big, strong forex hook in it. And then we've got other, so you can use that vertically um, up and down the water. You can also cast at them. This is new um, by Strategic Angler. This is the Naya series. I'm really excited about using this this year. Uh, it's a hard epoxy lure, really tough. It actually has a lovely wobble when it actually sinks. Um, great for casting, but also you can use this as a, as a jig and actually fish subsurface. And new in the shop is this. This is by Siren. So Jason at Siren Laws makes these. Again, a wonderful heavy casting bait. You can see these are big, big, they're heavy, 
Um, the gear you're using to cast them is very heavy. You're using your 80 pound plus line and leaders, so it's really important. Um, you need a lure you can actually cast with it. Um, I'll come on to run and gun in a minute. Bars, you know, tuna bars. This is a tuna bar, this is a small one, it's only an 18 inch one. This is the green machine it's called, it's a hard head with a, with a tail on it. Phenomenal lure, and we normally use 36 inches. Bars work brilliantly at the start of the season, but I'll come on to that in a minute. And ballyhoo, you can buy what's called skirts for ballyhoo, which look like a big bucktail. We actually run them naked, um, which is just the, the actual ballyhoo on a hook. Ballyhoo is a small silvery fish with a little with a little sword on it. Looks very similar to our northern sori, and they're just a lot tougher, which is why we use them up here for bait. Um, great bait. Sometimes the fish, when you move in, that's all they're going to take. Okay, so that's a kind of like whistle-stop tour of your gear. Let's talk about where you go. Well, obviously, we're going to fo focus really on... Um, oh, sorry, one thing I didn't talk about. Yeah, this puppy. This is a Pratico big game grip. So when you've actually got the fish to the side of your boat, it's important to swim it. I'll come on to that. You use this bad boy. I'll explain why in a little bit. But let's talk about where to go. We're going to talk about Cape Cod, and the first thing I'm going to do is talk to you about Stellwagen. And you can point to that on the map. Stellwagen Bank is a bank of uh, is a higher ground north of Provincetown. Um, it has iconic names such as the southwest corner and the southeast corner, which are on the southwest and the southeast corner. Um, I do really well on top of there. It's a phenomenal fishery. A lot of lot of bluefin tuna are caught off it. It gets thick with herring, thick with mackerel, hip with thory. Sorry, you get sand eels on there. All the bait species that tuna like are up there. Um, it's for a lot of people actually fish with bait up there. Um, you can troll, certainly on the eastern side, trolling tuna bars early in the season is very, very successful. Um, and you can also, later in the season, it can be a phenomenal run and gun location where you're chasing to cast up fish. Um, have some wonderful fun. When they're on the sores, we chase them all over the place up there. It's great. And it's a really big area, so you can spread out a bit. And you want to look for the, for the whales. Just inside there, just off the um, northeast corner of Provincetown, you'll see a bar called Peaked Hill Bar. Um, Peaked Hill is it's like 800 yards off, and just past there, you know, get into that deeper water. Again, can be a phenomenal tuna area. Uh, I call my, my biggest ever fish was 818 pounds, and I caught that on an 80 plus stand up a number of years ago. And at one stage, we were 400 yards off the beach. We were that close. So don't think tuna fishing, you need to be a million miles away. Um, Cape Cod Bay is the whole Cape Cod Bay. Um, there's a number of different spots in there as you, you actually can follow the contour lines around. I would say that if you have a recreational license, I wouldn't get too much into fishing the bay because it's mainly a big fish area, um, very much a bait fishing area. But we, you know, last year was insane. We were actually, you know, I was watching huge tuna inside Provincetown Harbour chasing the pogies. Um, but again, they're a big fish fisher. If you're recreational, I wouldn't really do it. I'd leave, leave that one to the commercial guys. And there is an awful lot of lobster gear in the water, which can make catching them very difficult. Then you've got East of Chatham. East of Chatham is quite a big area because it's East of Chatham. Um, there's a place called Crab Ledge, you'll mark, which is about 10 miles out that goes all the way down through Chatham. You're off Norset Beach, um, just directly out from Norset. We were catching them two miles out in 30, 40 foot of water this year, or this season that's gone. Um, and then you've got an iconic area, because we called the Regal Saw, which is about 30 miles out, kind of east, southeast. It's just an area of water. There's an old shipwreck there. It does really well. The key indicators east of Chatham is you're looking for bait, obviously, but you're also looking for the whales. Look for the humpback whales. Don't fish on top of them, fish near them. And the tuna are actually darting in and taking the, the bycatch from the tuna as these fish get stunned and beat up by the whales eating them. Um, last one but least is to go for the south of the vineyard. Um, so you've got an area south of Martha's Vineyard. It's called the dump. It's marked as this square box and it's where they used to dump munitions many years ago. Um, again, it's just a body of water. There's a number of other different areas. You can fish the star, the claw and other places. But the dump is a really iconic area. And the great thing is for recreational anglers, it's when it's fishing, and unfortunately the last two years it, it didn't do very well, but yeah, I had one of my most prolific bluefin experiences there. We caught 12 bluefin tuna in two and a half hours once there. So when you get in them, you can get in them real thick. And they tend to be really small fish. They're in that 45 to 65 inch category. So on a recreational license, brilliant fun to catch. 
they're, they're young juvenile fish, they're really aggressive. It's a wonderful place to fish tuna bars. And once you get into them on the bars, you can then actually work out where they are. Normally they're balling up um, uh, piles of uh, sori, um, so you can actually cast to them there as well. And then the canyons, you know, you've got the canyons, which is, you know, for the bigger boats for a longer range, very iconic fishery. They run all the way up the, the eastern seaboard. We tend to fish anywhere as far as, you know, from the south is Hudson, which is up in New York, all the way up to Ladonia, which is almost into Canada. Um, they range from about 100 miles out to 160 miles. Um, great for yellowfin, great for big eye. The bluefin actually migrate up through there and then they cut in normally through um, the south of the islands and then come up through Chatham. So the canyons is a very specialized thing. Please make sure if you do want to venture there, A, you go with somebody who's experienced, the boat's capable of doing it, and preferably you go with two or three boats and you fish as a buddy group. Because um, 105 miles offshore, 115, 120, 150 miles offshore, you're a long way from anywhere. So it's important that you're safe. Okay, so that's the whistle stop of where to go. You'll see those marks on the map. With you. It's actually on there. Um, and let's look at the techniques. Let's look at trolling first. Trolling for bars is the iconic way of, of trolling for tuna. And we're, you know, like I say, using these, um, using outriggers if you have them on your boat. Um, if you haven't got an outrigger, I'll be back in a second, Jay. We sell these from Chatterbaits, and actually the bird on the front of the bar, you can see has a vein on it. The really cool thing about that is now what you can do is you put this in the water, and this one's just gonna track really wide. So what it allows you to do is to put more bars in. Um, on my boat, we tend to run um, anywhere between seven and 11 bars, um, depending on how many people are on the boats and where we're fishing. Um, basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna run two on your outriggers if you have them, you run them long, you run two inside, you can run two off the cleats, and then you want to run one down the middle, which is called a shotgun. Um, they create a little splash on the water, it imitates a, um, a school of fish that, that's chasing and running. And there's always got one, which is called a stinger, which is sitting behind, which either looks like a predatory fish chasing them, or the weaker fish, and they're gonna get hit. Um, cool thing about bar fishing, I find it really hypnotic. You're just sitting back, looking at the bars, wishing for them to get taken down and the tuna hit them like a freight train. Um, one of my customers, Rick, lost a fish once near the boat and he likened it to somebody throwing a Volkswagen off the back of his boat. The, the amount of the hole, the size of the hole that was created by this tuna when it came out, probably a five, 600 pound fish. Um, bars again for the recreational guys, really cool way of catching um, the smaller fish. Um, the smaller fish are more aggressive and more likely to take it. The bigger fish are more likely to take bait. Um, that said, some big fish are caught on bars. And, and what you want to do is troll anywhere from four to six knots. If you're fishing down south of the islands, you can fish seven or eight knots because the fish are smaller. And uh, like I say, the smaller fish, they will take a faster running boat because they're more aggressive. And ballyhoo, again, you rig it in a certain way. It's a whole different seminar on, um, on doing it. We run them and it just looks like a you know, loose fish swimming on its own. Um, so, so we use those. Casting to visible fish, run and gun is the term we use. Um, run and gun fishing is really, really adrenaline pumping stuff. Um, we're fishing with these, you're, you're basically charging around, you're looking for fish breaking on the surface. The key indicator for that is you're looking for birds. Shearwaters are our favorite because they, they absolutely follow the whales and the tuna. Uh, herring gulls are good, don't worry about the terns because they're catching their own bait. Um, but if you're looking for gulls working often in conjunction with whales, who are another great indicator, you'll see the tuna, what's called pushing fish. They'll actually push the fish out of the water. There's some great video, historic video on our Instagram and our Facebook of uh, some great trips we've had where tuna have been busting through the surface, spraying sori out in front of them. Very, very exhilarating way of fishing. And you're getting your lure, and basically you're trying to cast this five yards in front of that tuna and it's twitch, twitch, and then bang. And the first 30 seconds when you're peeling line is absolutely heart pumping stuff. It's phenomenal fun. Uh, bear in mind, if you, if you catch a really big fish on spinning gear, um, I always joke with customers is that by the time you swap the rod for the third time, you'll pay somebody else to take your turn because it really hurts. Um, big fish is no joke on the spin, uh, but it is an incredible experience to get a five, 600 pound fish on the spinning. 
and you need to be very careful releasing them because you've fought them for a long time. So releasing the fish and letting them swim is really important. But it is a really cool way of doing it. But also whilst you're out there running and gunning, you can also, you're looking for these visual indicators on the surface, but you also need to check your, your fish finder and mark them. The nice thing about both of these lures, you know, and the Ron Z, is they sink. So you can actually cast, let them drop and retrieve them through the water. You can actually use large metal jigs. We use Nomad um, to actually get deeper to water and you jig for them. Um, can be very effective um, when they're not on the surface because if the baits are at 50 feet, the tuna aren't gonna be on top. They're gonna be at 50 feet chasing the bait. So you need to get down to their level. But it's a cool way of fishing. It's quite, you know, it's a bit like uh, vertical jigging for striped bass, but obviously the fishing it, you know, hits it a bit harder and you know about it but you're jigging away and then suddenly thump and your rod's bent over. So it's quite a shock, but again, it's exhilarating stuff. And the final way of really fishing um, is to live line. And live lining is, is really simple. Um, we use a lot of bigger rods. I tend to live line either at the heavy end of things with a 130. And when we're fun fishing, I use actually what's called an Ali Technos Gorilla 30, which is a very small reel with a very strong platform and a lighter rod. You can then catch these fish and all you're doing is basically you have a length of 12 feet of fluorocarbon, the hook into, into a fish, um, you then use a weight to keep it at that depth and you actually have, or keep it down in the water, then you have a balloon which you tie to the line and that dictates how deep it can go and basically you sit there again a bit like bars, it can be quite uh, hypnotic because you're just willing the balloon to go down um, and, and you just drift along over the fish. What we'll tend to do is we run three rods on our boat um, on one side. So what we'll do is normally we'll run a surface bait, one at 30 to 60 feet and one at 90 to 120 feet, depending where we're at. So we have a bait in all, all levels of the water. Um, you can actually use your know, mackerel is the go-to. Uh, pogies work really well and bluefish work actually really well. And um, bluefish are quite synonymous. We actually kite fish with them, a bit more complicated, but Kite fishing for bluefish is hilarious because you, know, you can get a you know, 500 pound tuna actually blow up and, and you know, the whole the whole tuna is out of the water by the time they finish because they attack it like a great white. Attacking a seal, they absolutely slam it on the surface. Um, but bait fishing, like I say, bait fishing will catch all sizes of fish and is very popular right now. Um, I'd encourage anglers, especially recreational anglers, to trawl more because you're more likely to catch the smaller fish um, because catching the big fish unless you release them properly is a bit, a bit tough. So that's kind of you know, a bit on the, the techniques. Let's talk about you know, the process of landing one. Is hooking it's actually pretty damn easy. You actually you either cast it, you either troll it, or you're soaking the bait, and the fish decides to hit it. Well, the first couple of minutes, it can be truly exhilarating. If you think, you're like, I mean, that's a Stella 10. You have a Stella 20,000, you got 500 yards of line on it. I've actually, lost the entire line to a fish because I physically can't stop it. And you just, it dumps line. I've had fish on my uh, big big rods, my 130s at 48 pounds of drag. I've had fish take 700 yards on their first line. Um, so, and your reel's just screaming as it go. The boat's in chaos because you've got to get all your other lines in. All, all hell's breaking loose, but it's really good fun. Uh, really exciting stuff. High probability you lose the fish. If after that first run slows down and you're still in control, the probability is starting to move towards you to land the fish. Bear in mind with tuna fishing though, you can do 99 things right and the one thing you do wrong will actually lose you the fish. So bear that in mind. After that couple of minutes, the battle starts and it's a battle of attrition. You pull it in, it pulls away, pull in, pull away. And it can go on for a long time. You know, I, Unfortunately, I lost the fish, but we lost a giant fish at eight hours and three minutes once. So you can be there for a long time. Normally the fight is between 15 minutes and three hours, depending on the size of the fish. Take it easy, you know, gently coach the rod. You see big rods bent double, people honking away. That's how you lose the fish, okay? It's a battle of attrition. Bring the fish towards you. Think simply. Um, fish will burn themselves up and do a lot of damage to themselves, which ruins them from an eating perspective. If you think right now, all of you guys listening, if you go and jog two miles, you'll be out of breath. If you go and sprint hard as you possibly can, half a mile, you'll probably nearly kill yourself unless you're used to it. And tuna do the same. If you fight them really, really hard, they fight really, really hard. 
and they just burn up and they actually physically can get hot when you actually gut, gut them. You put your hand in, it's hot. And that's actually burning all the fat, which is destroying the, the edibility of the fish. But yeah, bear in mind that you, know, you want to bite it nice and slowly um, and you're bringing the fish slowly towards you. If you get tired on the rod, don't be a hero. Pass the rod off to the next guy. You know, when, when we're on Yoshki, what I normally do is I let my guys fight a fish for 10 minutes. I'm normally on the wheel. They have 10 minutes. It doesn't matter if they're um, on, on, a, on a big rod in the, in the holder or they're a spinning rod. We, we pass the round around. We fish as a team together. A little bit more difficult if you're strapped into a harness. That tends to be a one-man band. Um, and the other guys, obviously, they're, they're, they're supporting the angler. It's important to have somebody by the angler's side when they're attached to a fish, literally to hold on to them. Um, obviously, somebody needs to be on the wheel and somebody's on the rod. So it's kind of like three people is, the, is, is a good start and above that is good. Um, slowly gain on the fish. Slowly, slowly bring it towards the boat. And eventually, the fish is going to start um, swimming in circles, pinwheeling. That's why Tyler's boat's called Pinwheel on Wicked Tuna. And that's the death circles of the fish. We're just going round in circles because they're not strong enough to pull your line away. But they'll just keep going round and they turn and they pull away and they'll come in. And what you do there is as the fish is swimming away from you, you just hold on. And as the fish comes towards you, you're lessening the distance. So that's when you reel. And you just come in and in. And what's really important when this fish is doing these circles is you don't let the line touch the side of the boat. If your line touches the boat, it's pretty much game over. You'll break off. Okay, I try to fight as many fish as I possibly can on the bow of my boat, even though it's a big boat, um, because what you can do then is you can back away from the fish. Okay, you can actually, if the fish is running, you just let the fish pull your boat around. You know, my boat is 39 foot, it weighs 17,000 pounds dry, and I had a tuna two years ago, it towed me uh, eight and a half miles at two knots. So, pretty strong fish, great way of wearing them out. Once the boat, the fish is near the boat, if the fish is like 60 inches or something, you don't need a harpoon. Get a gaff, big gaff, gaff it in the head, as high up the head as you possibly can, and pull like crazy, because you're trying to get the head of the fish out of the water, or at least pointing you. Uh, that way, the fish can only swim at you. If you get the fish and you gaff it and you're halfway down its back and it gets its head down, the fish will pull away. You will not stop it. It will pull the gaff out of your hands and then you're spending $250 on a new gaff, which is good for me, less good for you. They do float, um, but the ocean's a big place and if the fish swims half an hour before it, you know, the gaff comes out of it, you're not going to find it because there's only about this much that tree floats. But get it in the head and you'll be okay. If you can get a second gaff into it, even better. If you've got a harpoon on the boat, then when the fish is close enough, you want to stick the fish. I encourage people you know, to actually stick it and not let go. Don't throw it. Um, the high probability you screw it up if you throw it. Um, most of my boat, we stick it. And you want to stick it, if you can, just behind the first pectoral fin. Okay, And the fish will tend to be on its side anyway. Don't come down the sides of the fish because obviously you're just going to ruin the flesh. Okay, So it's really important you do that. Uh, sorry. Like I said previously in the presentation, it's not over until the tail rope's on. So what you want to do once you've got that fish's head up, if you've harpooned it, great. You've still got to get that tail rope on. Um, and and if, you've, if we use a smaller gaff, you lift the tail, you put the loop around, you lash it off. If you're going to keep the fish and it's a small fish and you fought it for 10 minutes, you can just pull it in the boat. And I'll tell you about the prep process in a second. If it's a bigger fish, you need to what's called swim the fish. And if you swim the fish, again, if I use my analogy of when I just sprinted 800 yards, I hate to think that I have to do that. But if I sprinted 800 hard, the best way for me to recover, rather than bend over and be heaving, is to actually jog or walk for like half a mile, just to let that lactic acid get out. And what we do is we actually use one of these, is the Practico. You put it in the front of the jaw, just in here. I have a dock line tied onto here. I lash it on and I just throw it over the side of the boat and then we just move along at about two to three knots and we let the uh, tuna just swim with us and you actually visibly see the fish from being towed to swimming. You'll see the brightness come back in its skin, you'll see the colour come back and you'll see the fish come to life. If you're just using, if you're releasing the fish, you'll have cut the line already near the, near the mouth 
And quite literally, you put your engine in neutral, you pull the rope really quickly, and all you do is you just, as the fish comes in, you just push away and open it, and pull it out of the fish's mouth, and the tuna swims off really easily. Great invention, um, made in Italy for us actually, but that's the Patigo Big Grain Grip. Um, you can use a gaff if you want to, or a hook. Bear in mind, if you're gonna actually release the fish, you don't really wanna be putting any more holes in it, okay? Um, so that's the tail rope, so you now got the fish. You now can go crazy and high five each other. You're now gonna work out what to do with it. So if it's a smaller fish, just bleed it straight away. That's what I do. Um, you can actually stick a knife through its heart, which is kind of like two fingers in from the pectoral. An easier way to do it is to just slit the gills and let it bleed out um, just with a um, fresh water hose, or sorry, your salt water wash down. You obviously wash the blood out of the boat because we don't want it slippy. Knife in the gills is the easiest way of doing it. If it's a big fish, you're gonna have to swim it like I talked about. Um, then you're gonna bleed it. I tend to bleed them in the water because it's just a sheer volume of it. Uh, and we just, we tow them along bleeding them. Get them into the boat, get your fish in the boat as smoothly as you possibly can. Don't honk it over the side and go over a cleat or something because it's just gonna damage the flesh that either you're gonna eat or you're gonna sell to somebody and they're gonna eat it and it'll, it'll ruin the, the flesh. So, you know, the fish has done a decent thing in being caught, so you wanna do the decent thing and look after it. So, what I say is to get it over as smooth as you can, lift it over, get it in the boat so you don't bruise it. And then when you gut it, we, we gut tuna slightly differently. And the reason we do that is the underside of the, the belly is where the most valuable, the most treasured part of the fish is, is they call it the toro, it's the really fatty stomach. And rather than put a knife all the way down it, what we do is we cut the gill plate off the fish, you put a knife in, you go deep all the way around the gills, then what you do is you basically pull the gills out, then you go to its vents, backside, its butt, slice a like two to three inch hole, put your finger in, loop the cord out, cut the cord, put your, uh, your salt water fresh down up its bum and basically blow um, its digestive system out. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna have a hollow fish with all of your toro intact. What you're then gonna do is you're gonna put it in your bag or you're gonna put it um, in your hold, but you're gonna pack that cavity with as much ice as you possibly can and you're gonna put all the ice around it. You cannot put enough ice on and into the fish, okay? And then you're gonna take it home and then to, to cut it up, you basically do one cut all the way down the, um, the center, down the lateral line, and then you can literally do a horizontal slice along the bones and you fold it out and you have the loins. You can then see the darker bloodline you can cut, cut out. I actually really, I prefer the loins to the toro actually, but, and that's how you do it. You can vacuum pack it. Tuna is best eaten pretty fresh, to be honest. It doesn't freeze particularly well, so I won't put it in the freezer for six months. Um, that said, my dogs love my uh, tuna during the winter. Um, and there you go, you've now caught a tuna. Um, it's as simple as that. So that's me checking out. I appreciate this is kind of like half an hour, 40 minutes, really quick whistle stop tour. Um, we're more than happy to spend the time with you in the shop um, and, and speak with you. We're all pretty much tuna fishermen. We love doing it. We offer a full outfitting service here. And if you follow us um, at Goosemook Shop, um, on Instagram and Facebook, you'll find that we do a regular um, video fishing report weekly where we're talking about it. We also have, and you can subscribe annually to what's called the Bike Club. So if you go to goosebikeclub.com, we actually have an online um, uh, forum where you can actually join and share tuner information. It's quite an exclusive club. We only have about 200 members at any one time, so there is an interview process um, to be part of it. Um, any questions, give us a call at stop, uh, the shop. It's 508-255-0455. Um, uh, my name's Phil. I own the place. I am a tuner addict. Um, it's really unhealthy, but I absolutely love it. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs>